May inayos pa si Gwen eh. Ah, okay lang. Bilangan mo nga ulit ako. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the first installment of our three-part webinar series on promoting good local governance in the Philippines, which is jointly uh, organized by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS and the Department of Interior and Local Government or the ILG. I'm Sheila Sierra of PIDS and I will be your moderator. Before we start, uh, may we have your attention on our house rules. For all attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry, and this is to prevent any background noise. And uh, to join the open forum, just use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of the screen. Just type your name, your affiliation, and your question. And uh, please make your questions concise because we have limited time. I will call you, I will um, read your question during the open forum. And uh, for those of you who are watching us on Facebook, you are also um, highly encouraged to uh, participate in our uh, open forum. Just use the uh, um, the comment section of Facebook. In addition, um, uh, when um, sending your uh, question, for those of you who are uh, using uh, WebEx, please uh, send it to all participants. I repeat to all participants and not to a particular person. Okay. With that, uh, we can um, begin our webinar. Again, welcome everyone to our webinar for this week, which we are uh, conducting in partnership with the DILG. And for this webinar, we pose the question, how can we improve local development planning and budgeting? And to answer this question, we will uh, Look at the findings of two PIDS studies, which examine the uh, fiscal and governance gaps among Philippine municipalities and also their current uh, planning and budgeting mm. framework. And to formally open our event and share her insights about the topic, may I call on the president of the PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we start, uh, allow me to acknowledge some of our distinguished um, participants. Uh, we're very pleased to, to have with us this afternoon some of our local chief executives. Um, let me just acknowledge some of them. Uh, Mayor Mercedes Tevez Goni from Baez Negros Oriental. Mayor Jesus Florencia Vargas from Abulo, Cagayan. Mayor Milagros Faderanga and Vice Mayor Fegalan from Banton, Rumblon. Mayor Nathaniel Escobar from Burgos, Ilocos Sur. Mayor Virginia Perandos from Carmen Davao del Norte. We have Mayor Dean Villa from Narena Siquijor. Vice Mayor Vincent Navarosa from Libacao, Aklan. Mayor Roberto Uy from Liloy, Zamboanga del Norte. Mayor Rolly Volante and Vice Mayor Rolando Volante from Malilipot, Albay. Mayor Cesar Robles from Panganiban, Catanduanes. Mayor Asela Sacramed from Sanchez Mira, Cagayan. Mayor Euphemia Oliva from uh, Gandara Samar. And we also have our colleagues from government. Um, we're very pleased that we have Director Maria Josefina Faulan from the Office of Senator Francis Tolentino, our um, friends from the ILG, of course, Director Odilon Pasaraba from um, Bureau of Local Government Supervision. Um, Director Jan Aris Makaspak from Local Government and Regional Coordination Bureau, um, Provincial Director Jan Cerezo uh, from Calabar Zone, and Director Sarah Jane Cerez Cerezo from um, the ILG also, and the Executive Director of um, um, Local Government Academy, um, Executive Director Thelma Vecina, and also Provincial Director from Davao de Or, um, yes, uh, Director Noel Duarte. Colleagues from the OF, um, from the Bureau of Local Government Finance, uh, Director Pamela Quizon, as well as Deputy Director Jose Arnold Tan, and also the regional directors. Uh, we're very pleased that um, they're joining us um, this afternoon, and also the Secretary and Lead Convener of the National Anti Poverty Commission, Attorney Noel Telonco, and Chad Commissioner Alex Brillantes, Director Milagros Rimando from NEDA. 
and um, colleagues from DPI, NIA, um, POSP, and also from the academe and um, and that and they're representing um, universities not just here in Metro Manila but all over the the country. And also special thanks to our um, board of trustees member Dr. Gilbert Llanto and Attorney Rafael Lotilla for um, participating um, in this afternoon's uh, webinar. Let me also welcome our other uh, friends, um, civil society, media, private sector, as well as viewers from our Facebook page. We welcome you all to our weekly webinar. This is by far the largest audience we've ever had since we started our webinar in mid-May. And we would like to thank the Department of the Interior and Local Government, especially under Secretary Maribel Sassendoncillo, Director Annalisa Bonagua of the Bureau of Local Government Development and her team, Mr. Richard Villacorte and his group, and the DILG Public Affairs and Communication Service for helping us in promoting this virtual event, which is, by the way, as mentioned by Sheila, the first of the three-part webinar series organized by PIDS in collaboration with the ILG. I was informed that the registration for both July 30 and August 13 webinars are already closed. That means um, we've reached 1,000 uh, re registered participants. Our platform can only accommodate uh, that many, but for those who are not able to register, they can watch the live stream through the PIDS and the ILG Facebook pages. From the PIDS end, I'd like to thank our webinar team led by Director Sheila Siar for organizing these weekly webinars to disseminate PIDS studies. This afternoon, PIDS Research Fellow Dr. Justin Sikat will be presenting two related studies, namely baseline study on policy and governance gaps for the local government support fund, assistance to municipalities, and assessment of the Philippine local government planning and budgeting framework. These studies are part of the outputs of the joint PIDS-DILG project, spearheaded by Mr. Villacorte of the ILG and, Ms. Sikat, and Dr. Sikat of PIDS. Um, just a bit of an information, the LGSFAM program provides financial subsidy to municipalities for the implementation of their priority programs and projects, such as, but not limited to, evacuation centers and disaster risk reduction related equipment, local access roads and bridges, potable water systems, drug rehabilitation centers, and sanitation and health, and health facilities, among others. The first paper identified policy and governance gaps, particularly in infrastructure and planning, to provide baseline data on key issues, uh, on key areas, and current planning practices of municipalities. Specifically, it established baseline information on fiscal gaps in local roads, evacuation centers, and rural health units. It also documented governance gaps in development planning through a survey of planning practices vis-a-vis -vis the DILG prescribed processes for municipal governments. The second study, on the other hand, examined the mechanism of development for local governments, as well as mapped out their current planning and budgeting frameworks. The objective of the study is to identify areas of improvement in the planning and budgeting framework of municipal governments in the country. To be able to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the system, the study looked into the mandates, issuances, and current reforms pertaining to the planning and budgeting processes of local governments. This topic is even more relevant and meaningful at this time, considering that the Mandanas ruling supports the increase of LGU's internal revenue allotment needs. Based on the, on the Supreme Court's decision, the source of um, LGU's IRA should come from all national taxes and not just from internal revenue taxes, which is the current practice in the country. This means additional budget for local governments to finance their programs and projects. It's therefore important to align local budget to development plans in order to optimize the utilization of resources in the local level. To help us gain more insights about the topic to be presented this afternoon, we've also invited Dr. Paul, Paul Hutchcroft, Professor of Political and Social Change at the Australian National University, and Mayor Cynthia Falcotelo Fortes, Barcelona Sorsogon, Secretary General of the League of Municipalities of the Philippines, as discussants. So I hope you will all stay with us until the end of the web webinar and actively participate during the open forum. With this, I'm going to give back the floor to Sheila. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mansell. 
Our presenter, Dr. Justine Seeget, is an assistant professor at the Varate School of Business, University of the Philippines. She is currently on secondment as a research fellow at the PIDS. Dr. Seeket has a PhD in business administration. She is also a, a PhD economics candidate, has two master's degrees on uh, one in management and the other in economics, all from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Her academic and professional experience is focused on the various aspects of the public sector and policy. Here now is Dr. Justin Sikat for her presentation. Justine? Hello, Justine? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Reyes and Sheila for the kind invitation. Um, here I am. I'm sharing my presentation. Can you see it already on the screen? Yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, coming to this presentation. Today I will be sharing with you um, studies on local government um, planning and budgeting. And um, here you go there. So these are, this is the outline of my presentation today. There will be two studies as mentioned earlier. First is the baseline study on fiscal and governance gaps in municipalities. And second is an assessment of the Philippine local government planning and budgeting framework. For each of these, I will present the motivation, research questions and objectives, the scope and methodology, the research results and findings, as well as the recommendations. Now for the first study, it is the local government support fund assistance to municipalities baseline study on fiscal and governance gaps. And I would like to thank at this point, um, our counterparts at PILG, as Dr. Reyes had thanked earlier, um, the PIDS management, RSD, RID for organizing this. I'd also like to thank the team, uh, Catherine Adaro, uh, Rixi Madawin, Angel Castillo, uh, Miro Capiri, and Alma Mariano, especially um, Lucy Melendez for for this, this task. We have been working on this for the past two years. And um, the motivation behind the study is that for decades, the national government has been assisting local governments in the delivery of devolved basic services through targeted programs. So the DILG came to us um, figuring out, we were figuring out how to, to, um, to be able to answer these questions first. How much do municipalities need to close the gap in key devolved infrastructure areas, such as local roads, rural health units, and evacuation centers? And this wasn't an easy task. This was actually um, couched in the preparation of the budget for how much would still be needed for the local government um, fund assistance to municipalities. So what we did here was um, for the first part of the year, we went to local governments and asked for an inventory of their um, infrastructure services, and I'll be explaining this in more detail later on. Now, the second um, question was, do municipalities follow the DILG prescribed development planning guidelines? And here, uh, the sub questions are, what are current local development planning practices and how can local development planning be improved? Now, the objectives, as mentioned also earlier by Dr. Reyes, was to establish baseline information for municipalities first on the existing fiscal and governance performance indicators. Second, to estimate infrastructure and fiscal gaps for local roads, rural health units, and evacuation centers. And thirdly, to identify governance gaps in local development planning practices. Now the scope and methodology. So we covered all municipalities. This is basically a census of, the, um, of all municipalities. Um, we interviewed members of the planning team. So here we had the planning officer, we had the engineering officer, we had the, it's either the budget officer or the accountant, as well as a representative from the CSO. So we use a mixed methods approach. Um, we engaged in analysis and process evaluation using both primary, sec primary and secondary data. We conducted desk reviews, key informant interviews and focus group discussions. Now, for the first part, for the first year that we were doing this, we estimated infrastructure and fiscal gaps based on the data directly collected from municipalities. So we had a, we had a bit of a problem finding consolidated data on the inventory of roads, um, 
rural health units and evacuation centers for municipalities. So what we did was we sent out templates to our counterparts at the DILG uh, SLGP office, and they submitted to us their existing infrastructure for those areas um, based on 2017 data. So that was 2017 data was our baseline information. Um, and the challenge also was in defining the ideal or targets for these key infrastructures. So what we did was we resorted to sectoral policy directions. What do I mean by that? In the case of local roads, we followed what DPIH had, uh, DPWH had prescribed that one of their targets was to pave all existing roads. So that was our target for local roads. In the case of evacuation centers, we prioritized the um, presence of a primary evacuation center in geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, or GDA areas, of which a municipality can have several. And thirdly, for rural health units, we, we followed the HFEP of the Department of Health that there should be at least one um, per 20,000 population. So I'll be showing you the results of our estimates uh, in a bit. Now, for the second main part of this particular study was the identification of governance gaps. Because a lot of the desk review that we had conducted showed that there were still areas for improvement in local development planning that would ensure that the development projects that were implemented would really benefit the municipality at the soonest possible time. So we got to thinking that we could conduct um, a census of development planning practices of municipalities. So what we did was we followed the guidelines of the DILG, uh, drafted a, an instrument in order to be able to examine really how the planning team um, did this in practice. So what did we find? Well, what we found here, the, based on our desk review, this is the current fiscal performance of municipalities. So this has been a trend, and it was in 2016 that we had documented this, that uh, municipalities are largely dependent on the intergovernmental fiscal transfer called internal revenue allotment. In 2016, it was documented to be 73%. What this means is that they um, have relatively low local revenue effort, only at 17%. So, uh, the local government income, local LGU income, is mostly from transfers from the national government. Now, this is important, especially when you link it with the mandate uh, in the local government code that 20% of what, at least 20% of what is given to local governments must be spent on development projects under the local development fund. And these development projects are the ones that would trigger development and trigger growth in the economy. Now, as of 2016, uh, municipalities spent only 76% of their local development fund, which means that um, they did not quite satisfy the mandated 20%, at least 20% of um, spending on development um, projects. And this has a large impact when it comes to the development of the locality. Now, what are the reasons behind this? Well, the reasons for current fiscal performance of municipalities was documented. We looked here, there is, based on the results of COA audit reports, they identified poor planning, lack of coordination, absence of project monitoring mechanisms as the reason behind either non-implementation or delayed implementation of projects. Um, our results found, and I will be discussing this in more detail later on, because part of the development planning process is to prepare project brief uh, for the proposed programs, projects, and activities. And what we found was that only about half of municipalities prepare project briefs for their um, proposed programs, projects, and activities that are included in local development investment program. Now here I present to you the estimated infrastructure and fiscal gaps. We are answering the question, in 2017, how much did municipalities need to close the gap for roads, evacuation centers, and rural health units? So if you look at the first column here on the left, that's um, with the background of yellow, this is based on 
uh, submission of 1,190 municipalities. So this would be understated. And mind you, this is based on 2017 information. The need to pave all existing municipal roads would be about 133 billion pesos to pave 8,331.41 kilometers of unpaved roads. So this is the very minimum. I'm assuming that it would be larger, especially now it's 2020. Um, as for the primary evacuation centers for municipalities with geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, these are the GDAs. Uh, a municipality, mind you, may have several GDAs. Um, based on the 1,159 submissions, um, we would need between 2 to 12.2 billion pesos to build 488 buildings. Now, um, I forgot to mention that the standard by which we compute this is our government standard. So the DPWH has a prescribed costing as well as the DILG uh, per kilometer of road. So that's what we applied here. In the case of the primary evacuation centers, it would depend on the kind of evacuation center you need to build, depending on the area, how many families. So that's why we, we, um, we have this range, um, minimum and then possible maximum, but still not completely for the 1,373 municipalities. Now for the third um, estimate, uh, when it comes to the rural health units, and this might change now, especially um, after what has been going on, the challenge to our health sector. We estimated at the time in 2017 that there was still a need to build 1,638 rural health units. And again, the costing was based on the DOH costing, and it depended on um, the location of the rural health unit, where it was, whether it was in a GIDA or non GIDA area. So that would range from 17.9 to 21.4 billion. billion. Um, so if you total this all, this would be about 166.9 billion pesos um, based on 2017 uh, information. Now, Having said that, um, we went on to identifying governance gaps in local development planning. So your patience, please, I know this is a rather cluttered graph, but this captures the entire development planning process of local governments. Um, local governments are mandated to um, draft a comprehensive land use plan that is valid for nine years. Um, from this, they are also mandated to draft multi-year, multi-sectoral development plan, which is valid for six years. And it is similar, same time period as the Philippine development plan. Now, based on the comprehensive development plan, which is six year, um, each uh, seating um, local chief executive will draft their own term-based agenda, which is called the executive legislative agenda. And for the benefit of those who are not familiar with the Philippine um, local government uh, framework, it, Local chief executives have three year terms. Um, so that's why they would draft uh, based on the CDP or the six year plan, uh, an ELA, what we call an ELA. Now, from this, there are implementation instruments that are drafted. The first of which would be the local development investment program. So the local development investment program are, uh, is a list of prioritized programs, projects, and activities that are identified to be able to close the gap between where the municipality is at the beginning of a term to where it wants to get in its vision and mission. And from this, but the local development investment program is valid for three years. Um, in the Philippines, we have an annual budget and the planning, planning process is, uh, the planning period is longer. So this local development investment program must be prioritized again to, into an annual investment program. So you get the, the most important um, projects that you want to implement per year, and it should find its way into the annual budget uh, or the, the appropriation ordinance. So for example, if a newly seated mayor wants to build, let's say um, three kilometers of road in um, the three year term. So it could be possible if that's a priority that you would divide, okay, I'll build one kilometer of road per year, and that would be prioritized in my AIP. So, so this is the overall uh, local development planning framework. Now, 
our study, our survey focused on the drafting of the comprehensive development plan, which is the six year plan. And here, as I mentioned earlier, we followed the DILG prescribed planning process and we focused on the five steps. Okay? The first step was to organize and mobilize the planning team. The second step was to revisit existing plans, vision, mission, and sectoral goals. The third step was to prepare the ecological profile to depict the current state of the locality and identify a list of programs, projects, and activities to address the gap between said state and the vision. Now, this fourth step was to prioritize these um, programs and draft the local development investment program. And finally, it will, uh, the final step would be to prepare the needed implementation instruments. And these would be the capacity development um, CAPDEV programs for the LDIP as well as the um, monitoring and evaluation. Okay. Now, these are our results from the survey. Okay. So almost all municipalities claim to have plans. However, when we checked their period of validity, these plans were mostly not updated. What do we mean by this? The first circle here looks at the validity of the comprehensive land use plan. And here, 1,254 municipalities claim to have the CLOP. But when we checked, because we asked them what the year of coverage of their, their most recent CLOPs were, only 64 or 5% of municipalities had CLOPs that were valid within a plus or minus eight year range from 2018. So the manner by which we reckoned was that we, inter we did our um, field work in 2019. So we said based on 2018 plus or minus eight years, if the club covered that period, that would be considered as updated. So here only 5% had updated CLUPs. When we went to the comprehensive development plans, uh, we can see that 89% uh, of municipalities claim to have the comprehensive development plan. But of those that claim to have the comprehensive development plan, only about 490 had those valid within. In this case, it was a five year period, plus or minus five, because the CDP should be valid for six years. Now, lastly, from the CDP, um, you should identify um, the programs, projects, and activities that you believe would help you get to where you want to go um, in your vision. When we asked about the, the presence of the LDIP, 97.7% of municipalities said that they did have an LDIP. But when we check the validity, which is now this time a three-year period, so it's a plus or minus um, in 2018, um, it was only about 31% of municipalities that um, had valid or updated uh, local development investment program. Now, now here are the highlights of the results of the specific steps. And I'm happy to say that generally the, the prescribed guidelines of the DILG are followed, but there are areas for improvement. Now for step one, Okay, which is establishing the um, municipal planning team as well as identifying um, the, the vision and mission. We see here in the circle here that it's the municipal planning development coordinator or the municipal planning teams themselves who are the ones who initiate the development or updating of the CDP, the LDIP, and ALP. So it's they do know the responsibilities, which is very um happy to see um and another very um interesting result is when we go to step two is that it is nice to know that the vision of municipalities 48 percent are collectively determined by the local development council so so this would go to say that um it is recognized by those in the community it's not identified just by one person it seems to say that um it is collectively owned by those in the development council. Now, the third step, which is the, determining the current status of the municipality through the ecological profile. Um, it is, the, the ILG has two prescribed um, 
the data set tools that are the RAPIDS and the LDIS, which are prescribed. But it was interesting to find out that the community-based monitoring system uh, is the primary source of data um, of 57% of the municipalities. Um, and this is used in the identification of programs, projects, and activities. Now, the CBMS is not just used for their planning. Um, it's also used in identifying priority sectors as well as the basis of budgeting. However, um, there is also a cost entailed in implementing this uh, data gathering. So the LGUs have to allocate a budget for the conduct of development tools, though this is not done regularly based on our results. Now, again, this is a rather heavy um, slide, but if you could bear with me, um, this one pertains to steps four and step five of the planning process. Step four would be prioritizing the projects needed in the local development investment program. And step five would be the um, capacity development programs available for monitoring and for the LDIP itself. So if you look at the upper quadrant here, we asked what are the tools used by municipalities in screening PTAs for prioritization? Because um, they come up with a long list and then they have to prioritize which to implement. Now, the DILG guidelines offer that there are top three tools. Uh, the tool one is urgency test matrix. Tool two is the resource impact matrix. Tool three is the conflict comparability complementarity matrix. And though the urgency test matrix is commonly used by about 48% of the municipalities we interviewed, we noticed that the method of workshop and consultations is what is the primary tool used for prioritization of PTAs. Um, so this is not, uh, this was uh, an interesting, a very interesting result that they prioritize their projects based on workshops and consultations rather than the tools that are provided by the PILG uh, guidelines. Now, um, at the lower, continuing on with this idea, at the lower left quadrant, how do municipalities prepare their LDIPs? Well, as I mentioned earlier, 50% of municipalities always prepare project needs. So that means that there is another proportion of municipalities that don't prepare project briefs regularly. So the challenge with this actually is that um, it, would, it might affect the quality of programs, projects, and activities that will be implemented. And this might um, have an effect as well on the development and growth in a particular locality. Um, I mentioned this also earlier, 68% of municipality used workshops consultations as their basis for drafting the LDIP, contrary to the guidelines of tools one to three prescribed by DILG. And um, for this, this particular column, 68% of municipalities conducted a second round of prioritization. So in the DILG guidelines, there should be a long list, and then there should be a prioritization first round, and then there should be a second round of prioritization. And according to the results of our survey, only 68% of municipalities did in fact do a second round of prioritization. Now, as we know, and as I mentioned earlier, this LDIP is valid for three years. Um, in order to be able to implement this, all projects must be prioritized for a year on an annual basis, which is why there is what you call the annual investment program. So if you go to the upper right quadrant of the slide, how do municipalities finance their annual investment program? So here it says we found that about half of surveyed municipalities were unable to finance their entire AIPs. And 51% uh, of these resorted to looking for other sources of financing. And this has huge implications later as well, as well as for the Mandanas, the effect of the Mandanas ruling. So if you can see here, 51.64% uh, look for other sources of financing, and 47.2% had received grant-type finance funding. So this grant-type funding were um, funding typically received from national government agency programs to assist local governments in the, the delivery of devolved services. So another interesting result, which I'll go back to later on when I discuss the entire planning budgeting framework, is that only 8.23% of the um, funding this, that's received 
by municipalities is endorsed by the regional development council. So this is one of the, the proper um, methods of uh, seeking additional financing. Ideally, it should go through the regional development council. What happens is that almost 39% is requested directly by the LGUs to the national government agencies, such as the DILG or the DPWH. So there, um, in the, to, to end this slide, um, the lower right quadrant, how do municipalities monitor and evaluate their projects? Here we can see that only 38% of municipalities claim to have monitoring and evaluation mechanisms for their comprehensive development plan. And 82% um, of municipalities claim to have some capacity development programs for implementing the LDR. Now, some general findings and recommendations for this first study. Well, the first issue was the need for updating of plans. And one of the recommendations is to enforce strict compliance with the local government code um, mandate requiring the government, local governments to regularly update their plans. And I know that there have been continuous efforts on the part of the DILG. In fact, there was a memorandum circular issued last October. However, of course, um, I don't know how it plays out right now with the current condition of, uh, under this pandemic. Now, the second issue that we identified was that um, the data set or the used for ecological profiling is uh, rather different than what what is indicated. So perhaps um, oversight committees, uh, oversight agencies can revisit the rapids or reorient municipalities on its use for ecological profiling. Because if I understand correctly, elements of the CBMS actually are part of the, the rapids and the LDI. Um, third, the insufficient observance of ensuring the feasibility and quality of proposed investment programs uh, compromise potential development. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's important that you know uh, and prioritize your programs, projects, and activities. And this would require compliance by municipalities to ensure project feasibility. This may need capacity building interventions in the preparation of project needs to ensure feasibility and improve the quality of investments. Um, the fourth is the evidence on arbitrary and lack of prioritization of investment programs could result in less impactful development projects and inefficient use of resources. So this is just to highlight to municipalities the importance of following the two round shortlisting and using the ILG prescribed criteria in prioritization, or perhaps right now would be the best time to, to revisit um, these criteria and work closely with uh, local governments as well in the process of prioritizing uh, programs, projects, and activities. And lastly, refers to the CAPDEV uh, instruments available to the local government. So here, strengthen CAPDEV, especially in monitoring and evaluation projects. Okay, so the second study um, is an offshoot of the first study. And this lies heavily, the results of this study relies heavily on the results of the baseline study. So here, um, we assess the Philippine local government planning and budgeting framework. Now, what is the motivation behind this? In 2005, the World Bank found weak institutionalized planning in LGUs and a disconnect between national and regional provincial planning. In 2015, the DILG reported that only half of LGUs had formulated CDPs, and our results uh, in the baseline study showed that only about 40% for those municipalities are updated. Um, I'm just highlighting here the COA reports also, which identify poor planning, uh, monitoring, and prioritization of development projects as some reasons behind the underutilization of the development fund. Um, and as well, another motivation is the anticipated increase in intergovernmental fiscal transfers because of the Supreme Court's Mandanus ruling, um, which implies a larger amount, um, a broader tax base, for the computation of these transfers, which would imply a larger amount going to LGUs, which would therefore imply a larger mandated amount of at least 20% going to the local development fund. Um, so the research questions are very simple. What is the current planning and budgeting framework for local governments? How is it situated in the national government planning and budgeting framework? And what are areas for improvement? 
Uh, the objectives primarily is to map out current local planning and budgeting framework in relation to national government planning and budgeting. And one of the motivations behind this is that there have been recent um, efforts really to align vertical integration of uh, local plans to the Philippine Development Plan so that although we recognize the independence and the autonomy of local governments and their prioritization, it's also nice to be able to map out how they contribute to the development of the entire Philippines. Now, another objective is to identify strengths, weaknesses, and areas of improvement in this particular framework. Okay. So the data and methodology, we use mixed methods, um, process evaluation using primary and secondary data. Desk review, um, we use the results of the baseline study, which I won't repeat uh, anymore in our discussion. Uh, and then we use the KIIs with LGUs and oversight agencies. Now, these, this is a summary of the more the larger oversight national government agencies when it comes to local governments. So we have the DILG, of course, which is there to establish, mandate, uh, and formulate plans, policies, and programs to enhance administrative, technical, and fiscal capabilities of LGUs. We have the DBM and the DBM regional offices that issue annual local budget memoranda review annual budgets of provinces, cities, municipalities in Metro Manila, and also update the LGU chart of accounts with COA. We have the NEDA and the Regional Development Councils under them, which are tasked to integrate uh, approved plans of provinces, highly urbanized cities, ICCs, in the regional development plans and in the Philippine development plan. Um, they are also tasked as well to formulate public investment programs similar to the LDIP earlier that I mentioned. And we also have the DOF, the Bureau of Local Government Finance, which is tasked to supervise revenue operations and resource mobilization of LG. So this is the mapping of the Philippine government planning and budgeting framework. So here we have, this is a rather heavy slide, we have the entire uh, Philippine budgeting and planning framework. So at the bottom here is what we had just discussed. This, this is the municipal, this would apply to the municipal and the component city development planning and budgeting process. So we had discussed the results of our baseline study on development planning for the municipality and how this six-year plan should be embodied, um, instrumentalized in programs, projects, and activities in the three-year LDIP, which should be broken down into one-year annual I, uh, investment programs that could be financed in the annual budget. So let's spend a bit of more time on the local planning and budgeting framework map. So that's the lower row I just highlighted earlier. So this one, if you see the, the, the gray shaded area, this one already we had discussed. These, this looks at the development planning process and how it figures into the annual investment program. So I won't repeat this anymore. We just discussed this process, but uh, the annual investment program should find itself into the local annual budget. And this is the local annual budget process. It's very similar to the national budgeting process. We start first with budget preparation. So there's a budget call and um, the different divisions would prepare their budget depending on their budget. Scheme. Afterwards, there's budget authorization and review. So it has to be enacted just, just as in the case of the National Expenditure Program, it will become law as the GAA. Such would be the case for local governments. It would be an appropriation ordinance. But uh, one thing I'd like to highlight here is that a higher levels of government may review the, the appropriation ordinances of lower levels of government. So this means that um, provinces would have the mandate to review the the appropriation ordinances of component cities and municipalities. Now, once the appropriation ordinance has been approved, this will already be executed throughout the year, and it would be followed with um, the review, budget accountability, and monitoring and evaluation, so that the results of the implementation in that particular year would feed back into the budget preparation of the succeeding fiscal year. So that's it. These are the principles in local budgeting, and they're very similar also to national budgeting. It should be policy based. Here, it's recognized that local governments have their own priorities, but 
uh, it should be harmonized in the development plans and reflected as well in their investment programs. Now, um, procurement planning and budgeting linkage, there should also be a linkage between the project procurement management plan, and it should be consolidated into an annual procurement plan. Um, budgeting should also be performance informed. It uses performance information in appropriation documents to link funding to results and to provide for a more informed resource allocation and management. And budgeting should also particip be participatory. So this was taken from the budget of manual state to 26. Okay, now let's go back to the overall mapping. And what is important to highlight here is that we show the role that local governments, municipalities, and cities play in trying to attain the long-term vision of Ambition Nat in 2040. So Ambition Nat in 2040, we know is a long-term view, and each administration we know drafts what you call the Philippine Development Plan. In our case, it's for 2017 to 2022. And right now, mid-year, and because of the COVID pandemic, I know that we are, um, um, government authorities now are reviewing as well, the, the PDP. But this PDP, there have always been efforts to, to be able to integrate it in, with the regional development plan that would be drafted based on the provincial development plan. So that's the first column here. So the mandates allow for the NEDA through the Regional Development Council to have an iterative process with the provincial de uh, government, provincial development council, in order to be able to draft the regional development plan. Now this later on we will see is, is part of the current efforts of the national government to to integrate in the, the, the entire planning process. But what could be improved um, would be actually the linkage between the municipal city development plan with the provincial development plans, because there is limited evidence as to whether um, this in fact uh, occurs. And the same thing happens for investment programs. But what's important here is that the arrows are two ways. So it's an iterative process. Each Municipalities, component cities, and provinces are recognized to have their own different needs and priorities. But it's important also to recognize how they can contribute to uh, national development. Now, the process follows also similarly for public investment programs. Um, these are the programs, projects, and activities identified um, in the planning process that would get the municipality or the national government where it wants to get in the, at the end of each term. But here, it, the process is not so iterative. Um, by the NEDA ADB guidelines, it's really unique what local governments need in their localities in terms of development projects is unique. So this should uh, hopefully, ideally, feed into provincial development investment program, which should find its way into the regional investment program and subsequently the public uh, investment program. Now, similar also to local governments um, that have three-year programs that have to find its way into an annual budget. The public investment program is a six-year thing um, at the national level. So we have to figure out how to break it down into the annual General Appropriations Act, which is drafted based on the national expenditure program or the president's budget, which is drafted by the, the Department of Budget and Management based on submissions of national government agencies. And here it's very interesting to highlight that. Um, I mentioned earlier that not all municipalities are able to finance their annual investment programs. So they seek grants from elsewhere. They seek funding from elsewhere. Some of them, I think it was 8%, seek grants from the Regional Development Council through the Regional Development Council. Um, some would go to the province, but most would go directly to national government agencies um, that have uh, programs that would uh, that are there to assist local governments in the delivery of their basic services. So this as well would have implications moving forward um, for when the Mandanas rule would be implemented. Okay, so um, for local planning, some findings and current efforts. As earlier, there is a need to encourage the updating of local plans. Um, there's also a need to ensure the quality of PPAs 
in our study, we found that in 2019, the DILG and NEDA had a program called the localization of the PDP, which offered capacity building on identifying development outcomes, crafting of investment programs, and identifying what is needed to translate these programs into physical programs. So these are current efforts that could possibly be continued. Um, Section 114 of the Local Government Code indicates that local development plans may be, may be integrated with those of the next higher level of local development councils. However, it is articulated explicitly that the integration of provincial plans and investment programs to the PDP is mandated, and it should be done through the NEDAS RDC. Now, since provinces are seen as an important link in the harmonization of municipal city development plans, there is a need for strengthened oversight to ensure uh, the integration of uh, municipal and component city plans into provincial plans so that there is um, contribution, the contribution can be seen. Now for local budgeting, um, some findings and current efforts, though local government units are given the autonomy um, to determine their own budget, there are also mandates that allow for review by provincial governments of the appropriations ordinances of component cities and municipalities, and by the DBM regional offices of provincial highly urbanized and independent component appropriation budget. Now, um, for the first sub bullet here, the provincial government uh, oversight, there is limited evidence showing uh, regarding this. So this could perhaps also be something looked at by our national government oversight agency. Um, one current effort, well, not so current, this was in 2015, the oversight agencies institutionalized the Coordinating Committee on Decentralization, the national interagency team, and the regional interagency teams for better convergence across the different levels of local governments and with the national government to enhance public financial management. And what we learned as of the date of our study, which was last year, at the, the REAT offers capacity buildings for local budget forum on, on budget and expenditures management and guidelines. But um, the NIAT, which is a technical working group under the CCD, had yet at the time um, to be convened. So some final remarks. Uh, ensuring the attainment of development depends on the ability to implement well-laid plans. Um, strengthening planning, this entails both identifying needs in priority sectors, interventions necessary to attain development goals, and carefully crafting, crafting programs, projects, and activities to attain these goals. Across different levels of local governments, policies should encourage the vertical integration of plans and investment programs, though still recognizing the autonomy. And there is a need to establish expertise at the provincial level to mentor municipal counterparts. Now, financing these plans in the budget, there is a need to continue efforts of convergence in oversight agencies and continue moving towards integrated management information for real-time monitoring of PPAs, implementation, and budget utilization, as well as finally strengthening and monitoring evaluation functions guidelines within the context of convergence efforts as well. So that ends my presentation, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justine, for your uh, comprehensive presentation. As mentioned by Dr. Reyes, we invited two experts to give their perspective on the issues uh, discussed by Dr. Sikat. Uh, so they will comment on the studies of findings and recommendations, and they will also share the insights on how we can address uh, the fiscal and governance gaps identified in the study. Our first discussant is Mayor uh, Cynthia Falcotello Fortes of uh, Barcelona in Sarsogon province. She's also the Secretary General of the uh, League of Mun Municipalities of the Philippines. A lawyer by profession, Mayor Fortes served as public prosecutor in the city of Manila and uh, Quezon City, where she also taught criminal procedure in law schools. She was city trial court judge of Sorsogon City before she became mayor in 2019. Friends, here now is Mayor Cynthia Falcotello Fortes. Ma'am? May you thanks. Hello. May you thanks to the leaderships of the Department of Interior and Local Government and the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. 
especially uh, the author presenter, Dr. Justin Jokno Sikat, and all the attendees. Just as I am steered by the responsibility you have put upon me, I am proud to be sharing online space with you all. Historically, my municip municipality is on the receiving end of grant type assistance and the LGSFAN from local access roads to improvement of water systems to extension of water connection. The last time I counted, two of those 10 grants thus far were cascaded this current year, one of which came into the coffers only six days past on July 10, 2020. It is an LGSFAM 11 million assistance for local access road leading to a mountain, mountain Agingay, Mount Agingay tourism site. So I am happy to, I am thanking LGSFAM and the DILG and DBM and all the agencies that uh, make this happen. The papers were um, enriching, to say the least. Both have, in good measure, value-added qualities to them. They provided clear visuals on the surveyed municipalities' inadequacies in terms of well-laid development plans on key areas, thus resulting in gaps gaps on development plans, policy, fiscal, governance gaps. I emphasized surveyed municipalities because uh, current figures on local government units tell that municipalities totaled 1,488 with the birth in September 2019 of Santo Tomas City then the municipality of Santo Tomas, Batangas. Juxtaposed with the 1,373 municipalities PID is surveyed, there, there appears to be a variance, a gap of 115. Be that as it may, from the lens of a local chief executive, they prod one to pause briefly into introspection. How is my LGU proceeding in terms of development? Are its planning process and instruments law compliant and DILG compliant? Did I obey section 444 of the local government code mandating that LCE should direct the formulation of development plans and implement the same. Sadly, we saw it from the presentation, a big slice of the pie chart pointed to the MPDOs as authors of development plans. The LGSF AM paper ushered in an impression that planning is the one giant step to a successful implementation of any PPA so that municipalities need to get it right the first time, not to be doing a rework each time. Planning should be strengthened, the paper enthused. The way to do it is by identifying priority sectors, identifying interventions purposely to attain development goals, carefully crafting PPAs, vertical integration of plans, establishing expertise at the provincial level. To my mind, breaking down the second into specifics by clearly defining into the process the identification of development goals would be a shot in the arm in further strengthening planning. At the risk of rhapsodizing about the paper, the
the LBSFAM paper, I must say that I am on all fours with its findings that attainment of development depends on the ability to implement well-crafted, well-laid plans. Competencies are the order of the day in development and governance. That said, the notion of mentoring referenced above comes into play. Self-sufficiency is a wonderful thing, but mentors help get the real work done. With a mentor, it is not like walking through the dark for the municipalities, but being guided by a local governance expert veering toward the right direction where the goals are and most likely with zero chance of a pitfall. Adding a caveat of my own, local governance expertise should be contextualized vis-a-vis -vis the profiles, attributes, and requirements of a given municipality, which is in need of a helping hand. The same way that development plans are customized, an expert shouldn't be a square peg in a round hole. The paper offered fresh hope, referencing to DILG Coordinating Committee on Decentralization, and the efforts of convergence in oversight national agencies. Those efforts are beyond municipalities' domain, but real-time monitoring of PPA's implementation and fund utilization is antidote to lacking project briefs or project briefs wanting in built-in feedback mechanism on the part of the LCE. It must be added that the vertical disconnect referenced in the second paper has been closed with the relatively recent effort of NEDA to align LGU's development plans to the national government's ambition in 2040. This process is taking place now in consonance with the local government code. In summation, I am happy to state for the record that the papers made their case. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Cortez, for your uh, welcome for your thought-provoking remarks, ma'am. Thank you. Friends, we are also privileged to have an esteemed academic uh, join us in this webinar. And our second discussant is Dr. Paul Hushfroth, a scholar of comparative and Southeast Asian politics who has written extensively on Philippine politics and political economy. He first arrived in the Philippines in 1980 and has returned as often as possible and also traveled throughout the archipelago. Currently, he is a professor in the Department of Political and Social Change at the Australian National University and was from 2009 to 2013 the founding director of the School of International Political and Strategic Studies in ANU's College of Asia and the Pacific. From 2013 to 2017, Dr. Hutchcroft was based in the Philippines as lead governance specialist with the Australian Aid Program. Here now is Dr. Paul Hutchcroft. Maraming salamat, uh, uh, and uh, thanks as well to uh, uh, Dr. Reyes uh, and um, to um, okay, all those at PIDS and DILG that have made this event possible. I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to learn from the excellent, excellent analysis of uh, uh, Justine Seacott and her team. Um, and. Uh, they have uh, produced two very important baseline studies on critical issues of 
local governance in the Philippines. Um, I'm also grateful to have heard the insights from Mayor Fortes from the beautiful town of uh, beautiful municipality of Barcelona in Sorsogon. I've never been to Barcelona, Spain, but I've been to Barcelona <laughs> uh, and it is indeed a beautiful place. So um, I uh, also want to um, do a shout out to some friends that I have uh, that I see here that I haven't seen for uh, many years, uh, in one case, many decades. So, magandang hapon sa inyong lahat, maayong hapon kaninyong tanan. So, I um, have uh, prepared uh, some slides that I would uh, like to um, go through and uh, want to begin just with some reflections about um, our current um, situation. Uh, globally, uh, more specifically, the situation in the Philippines. Um, we are having this webinar uh, at, uh, first of all, uh, a time in which there's been a great deal of discussion about possible uh, major changes in the nature of central local relations in the Philippines, particularly all of the uh, talk of federalism in the early part of the um, uh, Duterte administration. Now, um, a lot of that talk of federalism, uh, in my view, took uh, basically took the oxygen uh, away from uh, what are very important um, reform opportunities in uh, issues of uh, fiscal and governance gaps uh, in LGUs in the Philippines to draw on our title for today. Uh, and so we are taking up this topic at a point when it is um, possible to think about, I think, some some realistic solutions towards um, the uh, um, gaps that are being addressed here um, and uh, leaving behind some of the pie in the sky ideas of of instituting uh, federalism. I'm in the camp of those who have spoken of the, the fortunate falter of federalism in the Philippines. So I'm, I'm glad to go beyond that uh, and to be uh, looking, I think, uh, much more practically at uh, uh, some uh, reform opportunities. Um, so uh, if we could move on to the, the, um, the next um, slide. Um, so, the first reflection on the current context is um, that we are in this um, period after federalism has um, taken so much attention um, uh, in discussions of uh, central local relations in the Philippines. And we're also doing this in the midst of a massive pandemic uh, that often makes it difficult to um, discuss reform and to be thinking about um, long-term solutions, long-term reforms, let alone medium-term uh, solutions. I think that it's critical that we do so despite the pandemic. And in fact, the pandemic makes it even more critical that we look at some of these um, basic issues of, of uh, governance uh, gaps and fiscal gaps that uh, um, Dr. Seacott and her team have, have so nicely uh, highlighted in their two um, baseline papers. So um, moving on, I want to uh, talk about uh, some important contributions from the um, studies. And then if we have time, I don't know if we will, some other ideas uh, out that I have on uh, issues of, of uh, improving decentralization outcomes in the Philippines. So let me start off with just a, a, a um, look at the uh, a basic paradox of, of decentralization. This comes from a scholar uh, who's been influential in my own work, uh, who notes that one of the most curious aspects of decentralization is the responsibility that a national government must assume to assure the realization that decentralization, as doctrinally advocated, uh, is supposed to uh, serve. Uh, so in other words, uh, paradoxically, decentralization requires a strong and capable central state able to enforce the rules by which authority is being devolved to the subnational level. And I think that the authors of uh, Dr. Seacott and her fellow uh, authors have, have very much, um, uh, maybe not explicitly, but implicitly recognized um, this important uh, paradox. Um, a uh, corollary to that is to look at differential outcomes of, uh, of decentralization. Um, and um, 
uh, that is, especially in the absence of a strong and capable central state able to enforce the rules by which authority is being devolved to the subnational level, we should expect to see substantial variation in outcomes from one locale uh, to the next. Um, so uh, in some places, decentralization brings government closer to the people, and we can anticipate that devolved responsibilities and enhanced resources um, are more likely to be well utilized for the public good. Um, but in other places, decentralization makes local government the preserve of powerful local elites and clans. And here, uh, we can anticipate that devolved responsibilities and enhanced resources may often be captured for private gain, uh, gain at the expense of uh, public good. So I, I want to highlight the, those uh, basic um, uh, thoughts about uh, decentralization before I move on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to uh, look at uh, an important issue that has been highlighted uh, in the first study, and that is local ge uh, revenue generation. Um, so the uh, first study starkly shows the critical need for munis municipalities to close the gap in key devolved infrastructure services and to generate more revenue um, towards uh, toward that end. Um, and I think the paradox of decentralization suggests that local government units are unlikely to be able to do it uh, on their own, particularly in a patronage-based polity, it is rare for local politicians to want to um, raise taxes. Now, there are exceptions, of course. There are those that make a case to the citizens, citizenry that uh, um, basically uh, says, um, uh, we're going to be raising taxes if it's okay with you, um, but um, you can be assured that I will do everything I can to make sure that those taxes are improving basic public services. Now, um, one possible solution um, that I think is part of the Department of Finance um, tax packages is the National Valuation Act. And that basically uh, lifts up, as I understand, um, the um, updating of scheduled market um, valuations from the local level to the national level. And I think this has a lot of um, uh, potential to um, help local governments to uh, generate um, more uh, revenue, uh, in particular from real property taxes. So um, I think that's an important um, uh, proposal that is out there. I'm sorry, I don't know the uh, current state of that um, as it makes its way through the, the Philippine Congress, but I, I do recall it was one, part of one of the tax, tax packages. So um, we can move on from there. Um, a, a critical issue is just reducing high levels of, of dependence on the uh, era. Um, as um, uh, Justine's um, study shows uh, in 2016, 76% uh, of local revenue came from the internal revenue allotment, meaning it was not uh, uh, generated uh, locally, but coming from the center. So I wanna, uh, offer some thoughts on the uh, internal revenue allotment. We can move on to the next uh, slide. Um, and that is to look at um, best practice versus actual practice. And I'm drawing on the work of uh, a friend and colleague at the University of the Philippines School of Economics, um, uh, Professor Joseph um, uh, Capuno here. So arguably, um, uh, the most important and the most contentious element of the 1991 Local Government Code is the internal revenue allotment. Um, Professor Capuno notes that best practice is something like this. When decentralizing national government functions, powers, or responsibilities to local government, the appropriate public services to devolve should first be determined, after which the requisite revenues or revenue raising authority to finance the devolved ex expenditure functions can be decided. Um, so you first want to figure out what is to be done, then you work out the revenue issues. In, in actuality, because finance does not follow functions um, that were not aptly assigned to local governments, uh, local government officials soon clamored for additional money from the national government. Since the incremental era shares were not linked to the cost of devolved functions, local governments considered the first as their entitlement under local autonomy 
and the latter as unfunded mandates. So uh, that's, a, that's a note about what best practice is and uh, how actual practice has worked under the internal revenue allotment. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, as I said, there's a great deal of contention over the formula, as we all know, for, for ERA. Um, and um, we can move on here. Uh, uh, there's been no revision on that, as we know, on how to divide it, e even as there's been significant differences in levels of dependence on ERA. Uh, does it really make sense for Quezon City and Makati to continue to have large dollops of uh, ERA coming their way? Um, that's a question to be considered. Uh, secondly, there have been uh, major, there is soon to be a major increase in funds that will be coming to local government units uh, through the Mandanas ruling. Um, there have been major battles across time um, along three key fissures. Um, this is uh, something that I wrote up um, many years ago in the Philippine Review of Economics on the politics of, of ERA. Uh, and there I highlighted that you can find contention between the national executive and governor slash mayors. Uh, that's when um, Palace sometimes has tried to bring about curbs and delays in disbursement of ERA in uh, past administrations. Uh, secondly, um, between national legislators and governors and mayors uh, over control of budgetary resources, uh, the con Congressional Planning and Budget Office uh, about 20 years ago uh, characterized the ERA as being primarily uh, used to increase the salaries of uh, local government uh, personnel uh, and acts as a disincentive to local revenue generation. Thirdly, um, uh, among and within categories of local chief executives, there has been considerable contention. Uh, and that is, for example, uh, between mayors of cities and mayors of, uh, of, of towns. Um, across all levels, uh, everybody wants to have more, of course. So. Um, that's been a, an important um, source of, of contention through the years. And there was one uh, case that even went to the Supreme Court trying to decide whether 16 towns uh, might be able to become cities. And uh, it went back and forth before they were finally allowed to um, make that transition. So um, the uh, era formula is uh, highly contentious. We can go on to the next slide, please. Uh, and um, uh, keep going here. And the, the, the politics um, of the uh, uh, era has generated lots of tensions um, between Congress and governor's mayors. Uh, 20 years ago, I spoke with former Speaker Pro, Temp Pro Tempore, uh, uh, Tony Cuenco. Um, may he rest in peace. He's recently uh, succumbed, as I understand, to, to the COVID-19 virus and uh, uh, someone who has years of, of uh, uh, work as a as a uh, leader in uh, Cebu politics, um, but I had a chance to talk with him many years ago, and he spoke very frankly about some of these political dynamics. If we could go on, um, because most uh, congresspersons had political rivals among the governors and mayors, it was a natural natural tendency not to yield to these people who would screw them. Um, the last thing they wanted to do was to give away anything had, that had to do with public works. Uh, that remained at the national level. Um, uh, a concern was how increased revenue allotments to local government would reduce the pork available to congresspersons uh, to build and consolidate their constituencies. He said very frankly, more money, more power, it's that simple. Um, and um, uh, Congresspersons are said to have found decentralization most objectionable when the uh, local officials in their districts were bitter rivals. In some cases, congresspersons were at war with their own relatives and didn't want uh, their brothers to have more power, quote unquote. Um, but we also know that there are um, cases where congresspersons enjoy close ties with officials in their districts. Uh, who may be relatives as well, um, or they may be nurturing plans to run for office and uh, reap the benefits themselves. So that's some of the important dynamics. I think we really need to look at the politics of the of the era when we're when we're looking uh, at the uh, larger issues of uh, um, trying to increase local revenue generation. So let's uh, continue. I'll move on to uh, um, 
uh, one last slide on um, the era, and that is um, looking at uh, how the era um, ended a period of uh, unpredictable dependence and brought a more predictable type of dependence. So if we could, uh, uh, as um, uh, Noel de Jos of the uh, UP School of Economics, Professor de Jos has highlighted uh, many local government units are almost exclusively reliant on the era for financing, uh, treating it basically as a dole. Uh, the ready availability of these funds provides no incentive either to augment revenues or to use them effectively. Um, then um, he also notes that assured revenue transfers have not weaned local politics away from the imperative of securing additional resources. I think we've seen that in um, uh, Justine's data, the need for looking for additional resources. Uh, and some of that uh, seeking of additional resources comes through networks of patronage and vertical transactions with the center. So uh, uh, Professor DeJose notes that the patronage relationship remains intact. Uh, and then um, um, I have noted that um, the stated goal of the era way back 30 years ago was to try to undercut the dependence of uh, local governments on the national government. But in my view, the most important shift has been in the character of that dependence from a no notoriously unpredictable dependence before 1991 to a re relatively more predictable dependence after 1991. At the same time, the era has brought forth an important reslicing of the pie of patronage, creating important new opportunities for discretionary funding at the local level. Next slide, please. So um, the uh, study um, that we have just um, uh, had presented cites important reasons why municipalities often do not use their um, local development fund, poor planning, lack of coordination, absence of monitoring, also of critical um, importance. The study notes the issue of low absorptive capacity. So I think this suggests, and it was there in the um, uh, final slide of Just Justine's presentation, that this suggests the need to examine both planning processes and implementation processes. Implementation, of course, follows on planning and requires administrative capacity. So that raises the question, is this in good supply at the local level? And um, as someone who's been looking at local government's issues in the Philippines, I will say that I am amazed at how uh, little attention there is to the basic issue of the quality of local bureaucracy. Um, so let's move on um, a bit into the next um, slide. Um, there is a provision in the local government code that um, provides local chief executives with the capacity to employ emergency or casual employees, uh, some through job orders for local projects. Uh, and these are supposed to be up to six months. Um, if we could move on there. So a key question is um, whether local governments have the quality of administrative staff required for increasingly complex governance uh, at and local service delivery at the local level. A study by uh, my colleague here at the Australian National University, Hal Hill, as well as uh, Professor R.C. Balisakan uh, and Sharon Pisa um, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, noted that local governments continue to employ a significant number of non-career staff, which is an a priori indicator that normal recruitment procedures have been bypassed. According to a 2005 World Bank report, non-career staff are um, about nearly 39% of local uh, government personnel versus um, a little less than 5% of central government personnel. Um, let's look at some um, recent, um, more recent data uh, coming from the Civil Service Commission. I want you to look just at what is highlighted there in yellow, um, particularly at the um, bottom. Uh, Career employees at the national government level are uh, nearly 87% and casual and job orders are only about a total of 11%. Um, but when we look at LGUs, career um, personnel are less than half and casual and job orders are um, somewhere around 45%. So there, this um, affirms that the data from a, an earlier World Bank study, the one I cited just a bit ago from 2005, 
uh, still has a lot of, of validity as of uh, 2015 uh, as well. Key point, uh, you get a much larger percentage of casual and job orders at the local level. I want to proceed just to some uh, uh, anecdotal evidence, if I might, from my uh, extensive uh, um, travels around the years, often to uh, uh, observe elections, um, going into the provincial office of a national government agency in a uh, southern Tagalog province in 2010. I was struck at how the people, uh, not yet, not yet on Bicol, let's pull back on that one, I'll do them one at a time. Uh, the Southern Tagalog uh, experience was one in which it was obvious that the people who did the work were at the back of the office, but to get to them, uh, one had to walk by uh, lots of people who were presumably casual employees because they didn't have much to do, um, sitting and reading the newspaper, filing their nails or whatever. Um, this is not uh, productive labor to say the least, and it's no way to get development projects uh, actually implemented. Uh, another, uh, uh, we can go on to the next one, um, uh, experience um, that I heard about in um, um, uh, Bicol in uh, 2013, again around election time, was just the brilliance of a local province that managed to take one public service uh, position and divide it into 12 different uh, posts, so uh, 20, uh, 24 different posts rather. Um, so 24 people got a casual job for 15 days. Everybody got it for half a month. Uh, and so um, they were able thereby to uh, reward 24 of their political supporters to come in. Now, um, maybe these people were incredibly productive across their 15 days in uh, government, but it is a level of turnover that, that suggests it's not going to be the um, uh, best way to bring about development outcomes. Uh, next um, uh, came in Iloilo. This is Iloilo City Hall uh, in 2019, uh, where there were two colors of employees within the uh, City Hall. There were the Plantilla employees that had um, their um, um, uh, uniforms, but then there were others that were in these blue T-shirts, and they were the uh, casual employees uh, brought in by the um, uh, former mayor uh, to try to reward people. And uh, I don't speak a long ago, but uh, according to the local researcher that I was with, um, he overheard a conversation in our elevator in which a couple of them said, well, our gig is up in about five weeks, isn't it? You know, because uh, they didn't expect the mayor to win. They were just enjoying what they were doing uh, at that point. Again, high level of turnover is probably not the best way to bring about uh, highest levels of productivity. Um, I'll uh, just briefly note um, a couple other things from two cities in the Visayas where signature projects uh, in uh, two major cities, uh, we can go on here, uh, were, were able to, uh, were, were lacking continuity in their staff uh, for those projects. This is um, uh, something that you would expect those cities to want to be putting a lot of resources into, um, but high turnover uh, across both of those. Um, we can proceed then. Uh, on the other side of the ledger, um, I, I have also in many places around the country uh, seen very impressive levels of continuity and capacity, particularly in local planning and development offices. Uh, and getting back to the um, uh, key, one, one of the key elements of these baseline papers, the importance of better planning. Um, there are, I think, some important islands of strength, if you will, um, that uh, can be built on where planning officers, uh, this is anecdotal evidence, sometimes seem to have a, a, a bit more continuity than other bits of local, uh, it, um, local government administration, administrative structures. So how can capacity um, be enhanced? Um, building stronger bureaucratic capacity is a huge challenge, all the more in patronage-centric um, polities. Whoever figures out how to do it should get a Nobel Prize in political science. The only problem is there's no Nobel Prize in political science, but it's, it's, a, it's a tough conundrum. It's a difficult thing to do. Uh, and the study has suggested the need to strengthen uh, capacity development programs uh, in monitoring and evaluation. I would just highlight also the need to make sure that capacity development um, uh, 
um, be promoted for those who are uh, implementing the project. The second study highlights the importance of intervention slash institutional support from oversight NGAs, and let's look at them as a group uh, and uh, move on to the next slide, which I think is my almost final slide. Uh, four oversight agencies are highlighted, uh, DILG, looking at core oversight and development, DBM expenditure, NEDA and RDCs, looking at planning, uh, and DOF and uh, its Bureau of Local Government Finance, looking at uh, revenue issues. And, and some important uh, points in the study about the need to try to build up more vertical integration, provincial planning should include city and municipal plans, and establish expertise at the provincial level to men mentor municipal counterparts. So on to my final slide. Picking up on this uh, final point of uh, study two, um, the importance of uh, ensuring the attain attainment of development depends on the ability to implement well laid. In order to do so, I think it's critical to put in place the right administrative capacity, and this means the best personnel um, possible, uh, suggesting as well a need for a possible fifth national oversight agency um, involved in what would be a long-term challenging project, and that agency would be the Civil Service Commission. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, again, thank you very much Christine, to you and your team for all the terrific insights that you have generated from your study. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Hutchcroft, for your thought-provoking comments. Before we start our uh, Q&A, may I ask uh, Dr. Seekett for her brief uh, response to the comments of our discussants? Yes, thank you, Sheila. I'll see how I can keep it brief because the, the, the comments of Professor Hutchcroft are pretty long, but I'll manage well. Thank you very much, Mayor Fortes, and thank you very much, Professor Hutchcroft, for your comments. Uh, I'm glad that um, I made my case as the case uh, Mayor uh, Fortes said, and she's very sharp still in, in observing that there is uh, there were more than uh, 1,373 municipalities, and that is correct. Uh, the project that we uh, tackled covered only the municipalities, excluding those of Barm, which are 115 in number. Um, because of at the time they had they were undergoing a, a reorganization in their regional structure so so that's the reason why i also appreciate your comments in and i agree exactly with the contextualized um implementation of reforms it has to be unique uh, each municipality is different so the manner by which um development planning can be enhanced and capacity building can be enhanced would also depend on what the existing conditions in a particular municipality is so thank you for that also um, and it's good to hear that there is continuing efforts in the vertical integration between NEDA and local governments as well. So thank you very much, Mayor Fertes, for that. Uh, Professor Hutchcroft, um, I appreciate the discussion of both the paradox of decentralization and the differential outcomes of decentralization. And this is exactly what we have been observing and have been trying to explain for the longest time. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the Chain 3 package on the National Valuation app. I'm also incredibly supportive of that uh, in that particular, and I think the BLGF is here. Um, perhaps they can update us on that. But um, under that, they are making the, because the real property taxes should be the main source of, of local revenue effort. However, recent years, it has been overtaken by local business taxes. And the question was probably answered because of the reason that only eight in, um, in, in the terms of provinces, uh, the date, uh, the schedule of market value, which is the which is the basis of the computation of the real property tax, is about ten years old. Uh, they, uh, it's not regular that they would update the schedule of market value, which would imply that the revenue collections would not be um, up to market value. So, what the National Valuation Act, I agree with you absolutely, is doing, is if there will be a single value that would be the basis of the computation of the real property tax, as well as the LGUs would determine what the schedule of market value would be, but the DOF would approve because it was very challenging, I think. Um, in terms of ERA, yes, I absolutely agree with you also. The, for, the formula for ERA of 50% population, 25% land area, and 25% equal sharing has always been a challenge, which is why some municipalities want to become cities. 
um, which is why boundaries are, are, are being increased and not. Um, and I know before from my research that the original proposal was that the, the intergovernmental fiscal transfer would only be about 20% with 5% additional depending on a performance indicator. But then it went through the whole process in Congress and it turned out to be 40% across the board with the era formula there. So with regard to um, low absorptive capacity, that's also a very important factor that Professor Hutchcock mentioned. So, so thank you for that. So it's not just with the planning, but it's also with the implementation because there could be reasons why there's uh, low um, absorptive capacity when it comes to development, uh, the development projects. Um, so we could take a look at that also um, uh, budget accountability uh, uh, study or something like that. Now, um, it's interesting that you mentioned also about the quality of the administration uh, and, and looking into the job orders, because we would also always hear anecdotes of this. Um, and that's a very important thing, but I don't know to what extent the civil service has been taking this on. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope I addressed your, your comments and questions as best as I could. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justine. Now we are ready to entertain your questions in a, for our Q&A. Aside from Dr. Sikat, uh, Professor Hutchcroft and Mayor Fortes, we will be joined by Assistant Director Alfonso Mara Marali of the uh, Bureau of Local, Dev Local Government Development, or BLGD, and Mr. Richard Villicor, the Manager of the ILG Support to Local Governance Program, or SGLP. And um, for our um, first question, if I may... Um, address this, if my if I may throw or address this to uh, Professor Professor Hushcroft since he uh, has extensively 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 studied um, the uh, political economy and politics in the Philippines. Paul, uh, I hope this is okay. Um, and this question is uh, from Kari Karierma Bagas and uh, she uh, and this is about um, Okay, this is about identity politics in, in the Philippines and also the um, the effect of political dynasties. And she said the political climate is is a, a challenge to crafting to crafting, uh, implementing and updating of the development plan. Sadly, identity politics is at the fore when it comes to conceptualizing development outcomes. Um, things like um, what is visible and what can become a legacy. This notwithstanding the uh, dynamic motivation of political families across all levels of LGUs. May we have your comment on this, uh, Paul? Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, certainly um, uh, any analysis of local governments has to look at the strong role of uh, families uh, at the local level. Um, and um, I, uh, would uh, just highlight that um, uh, polities throughout the world, uh, political systems throughout the world uh, have families in them. Uh, the Philippines is not uh, unique in having a strong role for uh, families. Um, to my mind, the um, critical thing is the uh, institutional context within which um, uh, clans and families are involved in political uh, competition. So uh, we're never going to get rid of families. We're never going to get rid of uh, clans, uh, um, but they are going to be especially important in weekly, inst weekly institutionalized environments. So uh, to my mind, the most important way to deal with the problem of uh, dynasties in the Philippines, and we know that it's a, a huge issue, um, is uh, not through um, prohibitions, because I don't think, uh, A, they're likely to work, or B, they're likely to, to get through, uh, but rather measures that are intended to strengthen the larger institutional environment, and I think in particular of the need to uh, strengthen uh, political parties in the Philippines. Uh, and um, uh, this uh, uh, highlights at the, at the local level how, um, and in the local government code, um, the electoral systems um, that are used to elect local government officials are pretty much those that um, guarantee uh, the weakness of political parties um, by having uh, executives and vice executives uh, be being elected uh, separately and also through the system by which provincial city and town councils are elected. 
um, so something called a, uh, a multi-member um, plurality system. And uh, as uh, Nico Ravanilia now of UC San Diego has highlighted, um, this is really a way that uh, ensures intra-party competition and weak parties. So there's all kinds of talk. It's been going on for 30 years about improving civil society role in, in local governments. There's way too little attention to how to strengthen political parties. So I, I, I think that if we're interested in weakening the role of families, the most important way to do it is to uh, try to strengthen uh, parties. So the best way to do that is to look at changes in the electoral system. And it's in the electoral uh, or in the local government code. I'm not a lawyer, but I think it could be changed without a constitutional amendment. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, a question related to that is from Christian Nobleza. And uh, Justine, if I may uh, throw this to you, does the study have results about how politics become an intervening agent that prevents the actualization of planning, developmental efforts, and the budget process in LGUs? Okay, thank you for that question, Mr. Nobleza. Um, no, it does not as of the moment. Um, this report actually being a baseline study, we focused really on gathering the facts as we could. So it was a tremendous effort. It was a seven page instrument. Uh, we, we had to ask a survey company to, to go around all municipalities, except for those in barn, um, to, to gather the data. So as of now, um, this itself actually is, is a tremendous effort, but there will be efforts in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justine. This next question is again for you, and uh, this concerns about uh, the findings of your study. Um, and this question is from Krija Enriquez. Uh, Krija works at the Asia Foundation Coalition for Change, and she asked, what might be the reasons why earlier baseline shows 76% of LGUs underspent their LDF, while 55% were unable to finance their entire annual investment programs? or annual investment plans. Do LGUs plan uh, projects too optimistically? Justine? Okay, thank you for that question, Ms. Enriquez. Uh, unfortunately, the data would not be able to really indicate what the reason behind it, what, what it is. Um, but we would hear anecdotes about that. Um, uh, there's no substantiated evidence yet regarding this, but it's a very important point to highlight that um, the utilization of the LDF is low um, and that 55% um, of funding needs to be sourced outwards. And I think it's the COA would be the, the our, our basic, was our basic source for the information behind. Thank you. Justine, uh, this next question is actually related to that. And this one is from Joel Lassan. And he asked if uh, your, your thoughts, if the underspending is deliberate to shore up savings. Or is it structural because of capacity? Wondering also if mobilizing grants is a function of ease, then using local funds that are tied up with complex procurement controls. What do you think? Uh, thank you, Mr. Lassam, for that. And I think it, the answer could be all of the above, but our studies do not show um, this particular evidence. We would hear these stories that um, there are some instances when um, since there's no expiration to the local development fund, it could be kept for as long as wanted. Uh, there's also some instances for um, delayed implementation because of the late re re uh, receiving of the, the grants and all that. So the study does not, uh, our statistics yet uh, cannot quite explain exactly or identify, but those could all possibly be reasons behind this, depending on, again, contextualizing it differential um, municipalities and different governance across the municipalities. So I don't know if Paul has anything to say about this, but thank you. <laughs> Paul, would you like to, com to comment on this? Okay, no comment. Okay, uh, if I may uh, throw this next question to our officials from uh, the DILG, um, either uh, Assistant Director Marali, or uh, Mr. Richard Villacorte, the project manager of SGLP. Um, and this question is from Maria Cristina Alvarez. And she asks, uh, what is the difference between RAPIDS and CBMS? And why does the DILG prescribe RAPIDS instead of CBMS when in fact DILG should be the one 
to ensure compliance of the LGUs in the various CBM CBMM activities and assist PSA in the conduct and implementation of CBMS. AD Marali or uh, Mr. Villacorte, your uh, answer, please. Hello, sir. AD Marali or uh, Mr. Villacorte, sir Richard. <laughs> Hello, Sir Richard. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, did you get the me? question, sir? Did you hear the question? Yes, I hear the question. Uh, can you can can you hear me? Yes, sir. Very okay. well. Uh, okay. The CDP guide that the DILG has prepared is way back uh, two thousand seven or something thereabouts okay I, i'm not very good at at the years that was uh, spent for that so at that time cbms is not yet that is 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 not yet the cbms that we now know that has already been uh, the subject of a law so in short uh uh the 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 the, the, the requirements that the dilg made in the in the manual is based on what was prevailing then okay but it has not yet been uh in we within the context of the cbm is law okay so i i i i know for a fact that uh, uh because of the cbm is law that was passed then there has to be uh some sort of a of a change in in how the dilg would 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 uh, circularize the the planning options for local government units. Okay, thank you very much, uh, um, Doctor uh, Mr. Villicorte. Okay, let's now uh, proceed to the next question, and this is for you again, Justine. And uh, this one is from Noel Falonco. Uh, he asked, does the study include how many LDCs or local development councils in the country which are genuinely organized and in operation according to the purposes mandated by the uh, local government code? Genuinely organized means no political in interventions were involved in the identification and recognition of the mem members of these LDCs. Um, he adds, I am asking this question because there is a perception that majority of the members of the LDCs are handpicked by the incumbent governors, mayors, or even barangay captains in the barangay development councils. Justine? Yes. Uh, thank you for that question, Mr. Talonko. Um, it's very interesting because the our information on the local development council, we got it from the uh, regular monitoring practice of the Bureau of Local Government of Supervision at DILG. They have what you call the local uh, development council functionality index. So our study itself did not um, look into that. Um, we just lifted the results of the evaluation of the Bureau of Local Government uh, Supervision. And it would be great if you could, could take a look at that as well. They develop it, um, they, they, um, they revise it every year, the criteria um, regarding that. So thank you. Thank you, Justine. Okay, uh, for our next question, and this one is from uh, Nouvelle Bangsal. And um, we would like to ask uh, Mayor Fortes, aside from Justine, uh, to give her thoughts. Okay, uh, no Novel Bangsal asked, um, municipalities have the least uh, revenue capacity relative to provinces and cities, having very limited taxing powers. Um, hence, more than 70% of their income are from national government fiscal transfers. Also, more than 50% of their income are spent on uh, PS alone or personal services. Given this context and the highly fragmented nature of our LGUs, will the Bandanas ruling further ampli amplify the issue of vertical and horizontal fiscal imbalance and, in and equitable spatial development? You may answer first, Justine, then we will um, ask Mayor Fort Fortes to uh, give her comments after you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Sir Novell. I think he's with the CPBD, if I'm not mistaken. So, yes. to, thank you for listening in. 
Uh, that's a tough question, um, which I don't think I can answer because it really depends on what will happen once the once the Mandana's ruling is in effect. It depends also mm -hmm. also on who is sitting. Uh, governance, apart from the institutions, the the mandates and all that, it also depends on the personality behavioral of whoever would be the local chief executive. So, mm -hmm. so it may or may not. Um, I can't answer that with our current study. Um, and I wouldn't want to dare do that. So thank you. Okay. Mayor Fortes, would you like to give your thoughts as a local chief yes. executive? Yes, yes. Go ahead, um, ma'am. For sure, for sure. The Mandana's mana, the mana uh, because of the Mandana's ruling will be a boost first of the LGUs. Um, 2022, it's going to good money to the certainly the 20 percent development fund of the lgus is gonna go up so it will be a big boost mm -hmm. like in in my jurisdiction and i i'd like to tie this up to the earlier question on under utilization in my jurisdiction um i am very sure that the antidote to under utilization of the local development fund is monitoring monitoring of uh, the ppas embodied in the aip begin from begin to end meaning um you go through the aip from time to time as the lca should go through it from time to time and monitor the early stages of the implementation of the ppa ppa until they are done so it with the bandanas uh, mana will be a big boost to the 20% coffers of the LGUs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Fortes. Okay, let, let us now go to the next question. And uh, this is from uh, a follow-up question from Mr. Noel Falonka. And this is for you again, Justine. Uh, Republic Act 8425 identifies 14 basic sectors as partners of the national and local uh, governments in development, what can you advise for these sectors to be given the opportunity and authority to be involved actively in the local development councils? Could you mm -hmm. kindly um, repeat again? Sorry, Sheila. Yeah, the it, it's, it's okay. Republic Act 845. Yes, yes uh, this one is, again, for a follow-up question from Mr. Noel Falonko, and uh, mm -hmm. he asked, uh, okay, Republic Act 8425 identifies 14 basic sectors as partners of the national and local governments in development. So he's asking uh, about your advice on how these sectors can be given more opportunity and authority to be involved actively in the local development councils. Okay, so thank you for that, Mr. Talonko. Again, the follow up question. I don't think I can answer it categorically, but when we did our interview, we looked, we also included in the planning team a representative from the CSO. And this would typically be co coming from one of the priority sectors. So, so um, for all of, I think, for all of our municipalities, there was always one representative. It depends on which kind of CSO mm -hmm. we have in the study um the the rank of the frequency of a certain sector that's represented in the development council mm -hmm. but with regards to how to get them into i think that would be more of really within the political realm um among for example in a locality what is your priority fisheries senior citizens poor women so there yeah, thank you very much perhaps we can ask uh we can also throw this question to mayor fortes uh given her experience in Sorsogon, mm -hmm. in, uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Barcelona, ma'am? Um, I must say that, you know, there is no politics in, in doing that because uh, there is a clear cut uh, DILG prescribed requirements before a civil, uh, an organization uh, may be accredited and become part of the um, local development council. So there is a process, the Sanguni and Bayan has to accredit the uh, the organization, and there you go. Uh, there, there is a list uh, prepared by the Anguni and Bayan, and from there, mostly in 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 the case of my municipality, practically part of these to uh, a wider spectrum of uh, sectoral representation. 
It is very good to hear, ma'am. Okay, uh, for you. our next question, this is from uh, Corinne Canlas of the World Bank. And um, uh, her, questions per her question pertains to the GIDA areas or the geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. And uh, she said, most GIDA areas are least populated and may not pass the standards of the OH for a, for an, um, a rural health unit. But these are the areas most needing the RHUs. I work with uh, WB, DSWD on Kalahe SIDS, and I have seen this as a problem given remoteness of GIDA areas. So how can we adjust standards and make it variable based on certain criteria? Um, some thoughts from um, our um, speakers. Uh, probably you can start Justine and we can also ask uh, perhaps Mayor Fortes and even our friends from the DILG for their remarks. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for that, Sheena, and thank you for the question, Ms. Canlas. And that's also a very important issue. When we were going to, when we were estimating the infrastructure gaps, of course, we recognize that it might not be feasible to have one RHU for for this certain amount, or it uh, it might cross municipalities and all that. So, so these are uniquely defined. So, what we were tasked to do really was just to give an overall picture of how much might be needed to continue the LGSFA pro program and what we got was 166 billion but you're absolutely right it has to be very uniquely defined and sometimes it may not be feasible what the standard so it would depend on the current conditions contextualized as uh, mayor fortes said earlier thank you any other remarks from uh, our yes, um speakers yes ma'am yes. go ahead Paul. if if i may venture one permanent solution to that is Let's connect those GIDAs to the main, to the population areas of the localities. That way, that way, they would no longer be classified or categorized as GIDA. They would no longer be isolated or disadvantaged. So physically, let's connect these GIDAs to the population areas of uh, of the locality, how? By building roads, bridges, mm -hmm. connecting the GIDAS. I guess that's one practical and permanent solution uh, to the problem mm -hmm. of GIDAS. And the, the moment that we have connected them to the pub population areas, then that's the time that we can build maybe RHUs or health centers in those um, former, G does. Thank you very much, Attorney Fortes. Okay, um, for our next question, um, and this is from Arnul uh, Rowan Pita. Many LCUs have not been fully exercising their revenue raising power, especially its proprietary and regulatory functions and local taxation, and have become very reliant um, on intergovernmental transfers or the IRA. What is our guarantee that the LGUs will utilize their larger share to fund their mandates and not keep asking for more? Any of our um, uh, speakers can, uh, Paul, would you, would you have um, some comments? Uh, any thoughts on this? On this? Yeah, I think, I think in short, there is no guarantee that the LGUs will uh, utilize the larger share for mandates and not just uh, keep asking for more. Um, the uh, concerning thing about the Mandanas uh, ruling, from my standpoint, um, watching these issues for a long time, looking at the politics of the era, uh, is uh, how it uh, has the capacity just to um, pile more patronage resources uh, onto uh, the, the local government level. Now, that is not to say that all uh, local uh, executives would be using the funds for that purpose, but uh, when you give out a great deal more money without any clear performance criteria, you are going to get some results that are good. People, use, uh, uh, local politicians using using the money for good purpose and uh, other places in which it's just going to be uh, used uh, to um, enhance uh, electoral position uh, and not necessarily for, for development outcomes. So I think it is uh, concerning to have 
uh, such a large impost on the national um, budget um, without uh, having clear uh, performance criteria. So in short, I don't think there's any guarantee at all. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay, for our next question, uh, perhaps we can ask um, the, um, uh, the remarks of our friends from the uh, DILG on this. It's a bit uh, controversial to say the least. Okay, uh, and this one is from um, Cornelio Guantero. And uh, he said two of the recommendations in the first presentation pointed out the need to exact compliance or um, uh, strict enforcement related to that. Paul pointed out the paradox of decentralization of, of it requiring a strong center to ensure that what has been agreed at the top is implemented at the bottom. Why can the DILG not assume the role of the strong center in the exercise of its power of general supervision by ensuring that the provision of the LGC uh, local government code of 1991, especially with respect to the CLUP and CDP formulation, as well as investment programming and budgeting are observed by the LGUs. I have not heard in any news that a local chief executive or LGU official has been suspended for failure to come up with a CDP or a CLUP. Any thoughts from um, from our from our uh, speakers or uh, discussions. Uh, okay, uh, DILG uh, issued a memorandum circular last year, no, and uh, going by the by the implementation of the uh, local government units, we set a deadline that by June 30 of this year. 2020, LGUs without comprehensive development plans will already be flagged. When I say mm -hmm. flagged, and then that's the whole process of, of bringing to their attention their administrative uh, uh, non-compliance to the local government code provision. Uh, uh, sadly, dumating uh, itong ating pandemia, so in short, uh, because of that, we are extending the deadline from June 30 of this year to June fi uh, September 15 of this year. So after September 15, all cities and municipalities without a comprehensive development plan will already be flagged, meaning we will already bring to their attention. And then after flagging, then it comes the show cause order. And after the show cause order, then that, 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 there goes the administrative uh, remedies that is available to the state. But uh, we are moving towards that direction now. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Mr. Villacorte, for... Um... For your clarification, actually, what you have just said is a response also to the question of Ms. Precious uh, Joy B. Moises. Um, sabi niya, Ms. Sikat have, has shown on her data that on 2015, only half of the LGUs has formulated their CDPs. I would like to know how does the DILG takes action on the remaining half that were not able to apply or to comply since non-compliance is still happening at the moment. So, nasagot na po yan ni me sir Richard. Okay. Um okay, um Justine, this ne next question is again for you. Are there fi any findings or recommendations as to the gaps of the processes and framework on local development uh planning? Well, this um Miss Justine has uh has shown uh the results on on the study on uh uh, the gaps in, in terms of local development planning. So, na, nasagot naman ito ni Ms. Justin sa kanyang presentation. Uh, huh. uh, okay. Um, this question is from um, Johnny Man Mandokdok. Uh, what is the update of, CBF, of the CBMS Act? What government agency is in charge of providing technical assistance like modular modular training in implementing the CBMS to the LGUs. Uh, Mr. Villacorte, would you like to answer this? 
Hello, sir. I would like to, would like to defer the ano uh, to uh, either to uh, Assistant Director June Marali or to okay. the, uh, Dr. Celia Reyes because she would know better. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Regarding CBMS. Ad Marali, could you uh, get? Could we get your response on this, please? And then we will go to uh, uh, Dr. Reyes. Yeah. Good. Good afternoon. Um. Right now. The, the Philippine Statistical Authority is in the forefront already on the, of the CBMS. However, the DILG is still part of the ICC in the process of doing transitioning. So there are capacity development intervention or coaching sessions that are being done by the DILG until such time that the whole structure will be set up under PSP. So we're in the process of transitioning the CBMS from the DILG to PSP. Thank you very much, um, Assistant Director Marali. Uh, Mom Sel, would you like to comment on the CBMS Act? Yeah, as mentioned by Assistant Director Marali, um, we're in the transition phase now. So um, the ILG is in the uh, is taking the lead in terms of providing capacity building now to local government units with the assistance of the CBMS network. Um, and I think the ILG would still continue to be part of the capacity building, um, particularly on the planning, on the use, utilization of the data. But for the data collection part, um, I, I think uh, PSRTI and PSA would be um, taking the lead after the um, whole system has been um, transferred to PSA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamsel. Okay. Uh... Our next question is for Mayor uh, Mayor Fortes, ma'am. And this one is from Thea uh, Maris Perez. Uh, ma'am, she wants to ask uh, your opinion on why a large percentage of LGUs were lack planning and thus were underspending. Maybe get your thoughts on this as uh, a local chief executive. Hi, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Yes, I mentioned earlier about underspending and I um, put forward the case of my LGU. I said that the basic to, uh, as an antidote to, to underspending, the LCE has to do a lot of monitoring, periodic regular monitoring of the PPAs embodied in the AIP. Actually, it's a technique that might work effective for for other LGUs. In my case, um, I am um, I must say, modesty aside, that uh, I am unlucky enough. I have uh, data here from 2013. It wasn't me yet. Uh, the LCE was uh, someone else. From 2013 down until 20 what 2019. It has always been 96%, 96%, 98%. So I guess um, you should believe what, <laughs> what I am saying, Ma'am Perez, that uh, the secret, the technique is monitoring of the PPAs from okay. start to finish. <laughs> Thank you. Very well said, Ma'am. Okay, mm -hmm. our next question is from uh, Executive Director uh, Merwin Salazar of the Senate Economic Planning Office. And uh, he said, uh, Dr. Seacott and Dr. Hatchcroft clearly discussed the factors affecting the level of locally sourced revenues. What is your take on the idea that we completely take away from LGUs designing and passing local legislation on LSRs? Instead, bring them back to the central government in terms of designing and passing tax legislation and make LGUs just collectors of taxes. In other words, all taxes will be national taxes. Then ERA can be designed to be performance-based, hinged on LGU tax collection performance and spending performance uh, that is absorptive capacity as one of the indicators. After all, most LGUs do not want to impose or collect local taxes due to, among others, patronage politics. 
Mayor Fortes, would you have any thoughts on this? I <laughs> don't <question>. fully <laughs> concur. I don't fully concur on the matter about politics there. Because if the LCE has the political will, then any any revenue raising uh, initiative would uh, fall into place and uh, changing or amending uh, the the system now um, on uh, revenue collection would entail uh, amendment of the law or so it, it's going to be in, it's not in the in the court of the lgus it's going to be in congress <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Javier Fortes. Uh, we have some questions here from our Facebook viewers. And this one is from Jose Marie Trinidad. And he asks, how can lower level LGUs apply the bottom up planning approach if different levels mm -hmm. of LGU somehow have a disconnect in terms of goals and objectives? Any any thoughts that, from uh, ma'am? That it boils down to development planning, development planning, because it's gonna gonna start from the bottom, as as maybe that's his uh, notion, and it's gonna be the local development council who will, which will assist the LCE to identify the the PPAs that they they would want to embody in the AIP. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your response. Okay, uh, we have, um, okay, hold on, as I am reviewing the questions, just in case we uh, we missed. Uh, okay, um, Justine, this is for you. And um, this is from Corinne Canlas, uh, and he's, she's asking if the study look into the in income class of municipalities and the way they allocate their resources. Justine? Yes, okay. Thank you for that question, Ms. Canlas. Again, I'm assuming she's from the, the one from the World Bank. Uh, in any case, we did not look at how um, municipalities allocated their resources by income class. Um, because what we looked at actually was we were able to classify the what's this the fiscal gap by income class so that's what we focused on because we were focusing on income uh, um on fiscal gap we did not look at the expenditures but another discussion paper of mine um two years ago i think uh, uh, yeah 2018 i think okay. tackled the the distribution of expenditures by income class. so thank you okay uh huh uh, and this one is from celia floor again for you justine uh gender analysis tool used for their planning did you look did you look into this whether they use some tool which is uh related to uh an analyzing a gender equality have you seen this in 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 your study uh no we did not get to look at that unfortunately we just looked at their what their planning processes were and we asked them questions so I'm not sure if it came out, but um, no, we did not ask about this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, huh? uh, Mark Gamboa, no, we haven't asked the question of Mark Gamboa. And this is actually our um, our um, last question. Okay, uh, quite lengthy. Mark Gamboa from the faculty of uh, a faculty member of UP uh, Diliman School of Urban and Regional Planning. First, okay, she has, she has several questions. What are your recommendations to address the challenge of harmonizing all the other sectoral and thematic plans? Uh, the ILG's count was at 33, while our count was at around 40, 45 to 50 plans that are being required from the LGUs with the CDP. Okay. Um, what was the linkage between CDP, LDIP, AIP, and the virus sectoral? Uh, was there a linkage between these uh, different plans? Likewise, was the CDP linked to the CLUP? Mm -hmm. And uh, the CLUP, okay, where am I? The CLUP process follows a different set of guidelines from 
DHSUD. This forms part of the entire local development planning framework. Perhaps uh, you can answer this part of this, uh, these questions first before we go to the rest. Uh, Ms. Mayor Fortes, would you have any thoughts on this? Yes, they are. Yes, basic is the AIP, and they are they are vertically they are vertically connected. Connected. Yeah, they are vertically connected. So mm -hmm. they, re, they they are related to one another. Yes. Okay, Justine, would you have any thoughts before we go to the rest of the questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gomboa, for that. Um, and also for highlighting the 33 to 45 plans that are required, perhaps someone from the DILG can, rep can, can mention that. We did not ask this in the survey, but the feedback we got is that it should be thematic, should actually be part of the CDP. And Mayor Fortes is correct that they are vertically linked, but we did not look at it in particular. We did not look at each and every 1,373 plans and see if it was linked with uh, CLUP, if that is what, I think that is what Mr. Uh, Gamboa is. Gamboa. So we were not able to look at that. And I, and yes, in fact, that's in the entire local development planning process. But as also a limitation of our study is that we focused only on the comprehensive development planning process, uh, as I mentioned also in my earlier presentation. So that is what we asked lengthily um, about in our survey. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, follow up. Mr. Verlacorte, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to throw in a few uh, points uh, regarding uh, the long question. Uh, for one, uh, DILG, in we are talking to PIDs and at the same time we're talking to UPSURP, okay? So what we are talking to UPSURP is the notion that uh, local development planning should already be area-based, meaning it should already be uh, in the areas where the plans are needed. And one of the things that we are doing right now is to capacitate LRIs or local uh, resource uh, uh, research institutions for them to be to become local development planners so that local government units like uh, mayors or governors can just go to their to their to their state universities and colleges around and and ask them to help them in local development planning so, so in short, we're doing parallel moves. Like uh, uh, Dr. Sikat here is trying to scrutinize the CDP process because the purpose of, of this study is we wanted to show proof to the national government, especially to the Department of Budget and Management, that indeed local government units represented here by Mayor Cynthia still needs money from the center. <laughs> Okay, because in 2017, there was a question of whether we should continue giving funds to the local government units. And uh, when this study was formulated way back in 2017, the Mandana ruling was still not decided upon by the Supreme Court. So we mm -hmm. needed to, to make some evidence that local government units all over the country still needs assistance financially from the national government. That's why uh, it, it boiled down. Uh, ito yung tema ng study ni Dr. Sikat. Uh, so I think, uh, and then uh, I would like to correct myself. Uh, we have also just uh, recently adjusted the deadline from September 15, 2020, because of the pandemic and because of the new normal, uh, the secretary has again issued memorandum circular adjusting the deadline to May 30, 2021. But this time we are no longer just looking for CDP. We are looking for CDP and CLUP together in okay. May 30, 2021. And then after okay. that, the, 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 the wheels of the DILG administrative oversight powers will be exercised. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Villacorde. Those are very important information that our uh, 
uh, else you should take note of. Okay, next part, last part of the um, question of, um, okay. Mr. Gamboa, okay. Following the prescribed process appears easy for LGUs. Ensuring that they have valid plans in terms of the planning period covered is also easy. But ensuring that the content is of sub is of substance is another matter. Having said that, what do you think is the most appropriate governance scale to make local de uh, local development planning and budgeting? Okay, make local development planning and budgeting more efficient and effective. Um, Dr. Sikat or uh, Mayor Fortes? There, yes, ma'am. Um, there are guidelines that we follow. Like when it comes to budgeting, there are there is this manual, manual for budgeting. So this is not a a. Uh, um, Hello. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you, Paul. Yes. So we adhere, we adhere to prescribed guidelines when we do development uh, planning. Uh, this is not a, a fragmented effort on the part of the LGU. There are guideposts that we obey. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Fortes. And if we could throw this very last question for you, may humabul po kasi. Mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. is your take on the possibility of requiring LGUs to exercise its corporate powers and provide them with strict revenue targets coming from government-owned enterprises to supplement local budget? Uh, that, that, would, that would be a welcome development. But again, uh, there should be contextualization. Like my mm -hmm. LGU cannot compare with what the city of manila or quezon city so there it has to be realistic it has to be realistic in setting the target for for all lgs thank you thank you very much mayor for this well friends what a lively and engaging discussion we just had and uh well we hope that the presentations and the insights shared by our speakers um, contributed to a better understanding of the planning and budgeting issues confronting our local uh, municipal governments. Well, some important takeaways that we can glean from the discussion um, are the need to strengthen the capacities of our LGUs, not just in planning and budgeting, but also in monitoring and evaluation of projects. Um, better oversight by the concerned agencies in ensuring that our LGUs are regularly, regularly updating their development plans. Um, more integrated management information systems for real-time monitoring of project implementation and better harmonization of programs, projects, and activities across different uh, levels of LGUs. Let us thank our resource speaker, Dr. Justin Seacott, our discussants, Mayor Fortes, and uh, Professor, Professor Hutchcraft. And our friends from the L, from the DILG, mm -hmm. Assistant Director Alfonso Marali and SGLP Program Manager, Mr. Richard Villacorte, for their very insightful uh, uh, remarks and comments. Let us give them a big virtual clap. And thank you to all of you for your active participation. Okay, maraming salamat po. Okay, I now okay, call on uh, BLG, the Assistant Director Alfonso Marali, for his closing remarks. AD Marali. Okay, good afternoon. Magandang hapon sa lahat. Uh, at the onset, allow me on behalf of the department to thank everyone for joining us in this three part series, SIDS DILG, Web SIDS DILG webinar series on promoting good local governance in the Philippines. Uh, your invaluable insights and active participation have made this webinar successful event. This partnership with BIDS comments because of our desire to learn where the municipal governments are in terms of key infrastructure and identify existing gaps in the matter of governance, policy, project execution, and fiscal concerns at the local level. We thought that this endeavor might be the first step in establishing a baseline of data of key municipal infrastructure projects and governance practices, especially in the areas of budgeting and development planning. 
Now, we see the products of our efforts are highly relevant to the ongoing policy-making efforts that will shape our nation's long-term countryside development, as well as to further decentralization of the responsibility and resource structure. Uh, the DILT strongly supports the findings and key recommendations of this study, as we have discussed this afternoon. We have endeavored to integrate its concern in our own activities and strategic planning, from crafting plans for local development and supervision, to preparing continuous issue one assistance to our local government. This is especially timely, as we are developing a transition plan to cope with the planned devolution of basic services to local governments come 2020. Please do share the information and knowledge you think in this webinar in your own respective networks and offices. We hope that the report will reach not only government agencies, but also groups such as non-government organizations, private sector, the academic, and the others. By increasing the number of people who have access to the report and utilize its findings, we are helping the push to push for greater transparency, accountability, and sense of responsibility from all levels of government. Allow me at this point to conclude this session by extending our sincere words of gratitude to the entire PIDS family for a successful partnership and implementation of this project. To Dr. Justin uh, Diseka for always making herself available to discuss the contents of the project. To all the municipal LGUs that provided the insights and actively participated in the course of this study. And to all the DILG regional and field offices that ensured the smooth coordination and facilitation all throughout the project implementation to the DILG bureaus and offices that provided the inputs and assistance, and of course, to the host and organizers of this activity, to the speakers and panelists, and to everyone who has made this activity possible. I hope that you have enjoyed this webinar session and wish to invite everyone to the subsequent activities on July 30 and August 30. Muli, maraming salamat on behalf of the department at magandang hapon sa atin. Thank you very much. Assistant Director Morali of the BLGD, before we finally close, um, we have a few reminders. First, uh, you can access the presentation of uh, Dr. Seacott uh, from the PIDS website. Um, flash on the screen is the link, but uh, don't, don't worry, we will also email you the link. Please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after uh, the webinar. We will also email you the link after the event. Your comments are very important to us to improve our webinars. And please regularly visit our website, of course, also the website of the DILG. And please also follow us on our social media pages. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from government, academe, uh, civil society, business, and international development community who join us today. Uh, and you can see the names wow. of these offices on the screen. And of course, our deepest acknowledge, acknowledgments to the DILG for partnering us for, for uh, partnering with us in this uh, webinar. Again, um, our acknowledgments to the BL, B, BG, BLGD headed by uh, Dr. Director Anna Bonagua and the SLGP program headed by Mr. Richard Villacorde for their all out support in, in organizing this webinar with us as well as in disseminating information about our webinar series. As mentioned by uh, A.D. Marali, we have uh, two more webinars after this, one on July 30 and another on August 13. Next week on July 23, we will talk about another interesting topic, which is a PIDS study conducted by our President, Dr. Celia Reyes, on the government programs for senior citizens. We hope you could join us again. See you again next week. Stay safe and stay healthy. Maraming maraming salamat po. RID. Thank you to Thank you Professor Hutch.
Thank you very much, Professor Hutchcroft, Mayor Cortez. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me to this forum session. Thank you. Thank you very much, A.D. Barali and Mr. Villa Corte. Marami pong salamat. Bye. Tapos na ba? Hello, Gwen. Are you here? Yes, Mom Justine. Yes, Mom. Hi. Thank you so much again, ha. Question ako. Kasi there are comments here in the chat. Can we save the text in the chat? Or paano ba to? Ano ba? Sorry, Mom Justine. Hindi ko pa oh, are, niya. There, I'm sorry. There are in the chat box. There are. Um, comments that I was not able to read. Will we be able to save the text of the chat as a document? Uh, uh, yes, I can actually save it and send it to you. I kindly please do so. Thank you so much. Well, I'm just seeing, uh, hey, yes. can I ask your permission to upload your PowerPoint on the PIDS website? So, yeah. Um, will you delete my hidden files? I mean, how would you upload uh, it as a. Let's just I... discuss via email. Na lang pa. Ah, sige. Okay, sige. Thanks. Bye, Sheila. Bye, thank you so much, Sheila. Salamat sa inyo lahat, Miss Wayne. Bye. Salamat, ma'am. Congrats. Oh, thanks. Oh, yung text, yung content. <laughs> I'll send it to you, pa. Thanks, thanks. Bye.